Good afternoon, everyone. Um, our topic was making the business case, show me the value. Um, so that was pretty easy. We'll just take Rashid's uh, model and uh, yeah, you know, we adopted it. Uh, but then we took it and then we also kind of ripped it apart. So I think from the business case and the business model, a couple of key things. Um, one is that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So it's going to be dynamic. It will change depending on where the customer is, where the municipality is. Um, there's going to be a varied approach between OPEX and CAPEX. But one of the key things, you know, in terms of a business model and a business case for smart metering and AMI is what are the other challenges that you will experience within an industry. So as much as you're forecasting for 100 homes or X amount of new people coming on board and paying, you also need to factor in for 100 homes that's maybe going off grid, that's going to invest in their own water, that's maybe going to drill their own boreholes. So, um, yeah, so just a few challenges. There's culture, there's economic challenges, there's service delivery, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of variables that needs to be factored into, into this business case, and it's going to be a mix between CapEx and OpEx. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, but um, one of the benefits, what was said earlier by the gentleman from uh, Ghana Water that the salaries are up and everyone's happy. So isn't that the business case? Cool, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we spoke about uh, business readiness. Um, I put in the challenge at the start to say I didn't think businesses were ready. Uh, the table, who were really, really supportive, actually made the, the case worse than what I thought it was. Oh, wow. So uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, very much because of siloed approaches that people were saying, um, but we found uh, a commonality in the importance of understanding the maturity of any utility or municipality before it starts on an AMI program. Uh, the consensus was people start on a program really not understanding where they're starting from, and more importantly, no idea where they were going to get to at the end of it. And quite commonly, uh, a lot of the benefits were by surprise rather than by plan. Uh, and we were looking at figures around less than 10% of benefits uh, against what the AMI could actually do. So a lot of issues around business maturity in terms of that. Um, we also talked about sort of the main drivers, uh, things like procurement models, uh, availability, and it was quite interesting to see there's lots of innovation that potentially could be done there. And going back to the, the point made around uh, cost benefit, um, one of the things that we were discussing was should there be actually more of a template that when you're looking at business readiness, it should be comparable because AMI, whether it's in Cape Town, wider South Africa, Africa, or across the world, is pretty much the same. Um, the drivers are tariff, water balance. So with, with, at the end, we were saying, is there an opportunity for Swan organization to create some consistency of approach? So when then we are putting uh, a case forward, at least then it's consistent. Uh, thanks again for the table, and uh, thanks for your time. Great, wow. Excellent uh, summary and, and very concise. Thank you. We had the white flag. Um, I think we had the best topic. Um, and it was, I think, the big elephant in the room, the big question, mechanical versus ultrasonic, um, or static at least, and what's the, what's the option, what's the best route? And I think we had lists probably from here to Messina. I mean, there's no, at the end of the day, no silver bullet that fits all solutions. I think it's really um, each individual project will have its own specific solution. Um, but some of the key topics uh, and discussions point that we raised was, first one, I think, uh, is accuracy. Um, with mechanical meters, we know the drawback that it, accuracy does drop over time because of um, wear and tear and, and, and stuff like that. But uh, on the good point, again, is that the end user or the municipality knows what to expect. There has been there's a lot of historical data for the last 40, 50, 60 years on that, so they know what to expect, they know what the drop will be, so one could actually then um, accommodate for that. Where with ultrasonic meter, the potential is there that you do not know. Um, I think there is history, there is data available, but limited compared to that of mechanical, so um, if you do that comparison. So you do not necessarily know what to expect after 13 years or 14 years or so. Um, but I mean, time will tell. Um, and then the initial cost, obviously, with mechanical meters, I mean, it's a, literally a fifth of the price. Uh, anything from 300 rand, um, slightly more, where, I mean, uh, any static meter is exponentially more. Um, 
water quality, I mean, that's a major issue, especially in, not necessarily in South Africa, but up in Africa as well, where static meter is, is by far the, I mean, the, the best option to go there if you have a lot of sand, if a lot of impurities in the water. Um, and then communication, I mean, that's a, a, a self-explanatory point with uh, uh, communication that's already built into the meter, where with a, a volumetric or um, any type of mechanical meter, that's an added cost to it. And then uh, data integrity, um, I mean, the, the, the word trust came up again. So um, people, it's easy to, to have trust on a um, mechanical meter because they know what to expect, they know what to do on that. Um, one gentleman mentioned that with an electronic meter, there's a lot of nice lights and uh, data, everything going on, but even if, it's even if all the taps is closed, there's still a bit of... Uh, moving going on that whether it's true or not i mean but that's just i think the concept that's um uh, out in the room and um yeah i think that's it great thanks very much <laughs> who's next i think we're, are we i'm going to keep the mic actually i'll take the mic over here you guys are very ready okay that'll be great because uh, we talking about trust, so we'll follow straight on from the last one. Um, okay, so we started ours, which was uh, to build internal trust. Uh, we discussed the benefits. Uh, this was, it allowed us to explore quicker in times of uncertainty and understand expectations and obtain buy-in. Uh, you'll notice there's a lot of scientists and or engineers in our team because we defined how to build trust as an equation of trust is equal to consistency over time. <laughs> Um, we defined barriers, so we did barriers were your biases, so who, you, who you've worked with, where you've come from, all affecting the, the current situation, your fears of change, profiling, uh, we all com we all told to tr treat everybody exactly the same, but that's actually not how it works, right? You have to define who you're talking to, how you're going to talk to them, what you're going to talk to them about. Um, and a very interesting point from us is that we said all comms plans always communicate the positive. And it's a default for organizations because One if you minute. communicate the negative, are we prepared for the outcome of that and how to react? Uh, again, the engineers came out because then we tried to measure trust and we were told you can't trust somebody 20%, trust is on and off. Uh, others were, it's a gut feeling, maybe you can pretend to trust. That was quite a robust discussion on the side. Uh, and in conclusion, so our so what was trust is building and keeping trust uh, is scientific and is not scientific. We had two very strong challenges on the side. Um, trust is both ways. It is based on action, it's consistency and transparency, authenticity and honesty. And essentially we concluded that trust is you taking a risk. Great. Thanks very much. Such an important topic. <laughs> Such an important topic. Um, okay, are, are you, is that, is that it? Cool. Is anyone else on the side? No. Okay, then red flag. Cool. Yeah, so we were the red flag. Um, 120, 119, 118, still good. Yeah. <laughs> um, can't remember the topic, let's call it No Smart with Start. Basically, the focus being on, you know, you need a some sort of digital platform to start linking up all of these automated meter readings. Um, then further on, focused on whether, you know, metering at the end user versus bulk meters, uh, what should be in place first, um, you know, setting up zones, etc. Then the integration of all of this data is quite crucial. Um, hydraulic modeling maybe start off with something static and then move into time simulation to, to do this. The, the one colleague actually was speaking about you know, a lot of these things, they roll it out and by chance it was in the right place. But if you actually plan properly, you can do it right the first time around. So that's something that could tie into that. Um, you know, and then we, this thing kind of rolled on into virtual sensors, um, you know, pre predicting stuff like that and accessibility stuff on the cloud. But then we actually went on further. So what are the challenges? And um, we feel in South Africa, you know, sometimes the main focus I think in this room is we need to conserve water, we need to save water where it's lost. Um, and maybe we doing smart meeting at the end meter for a lot of the municipalities aren't on where they should be focusing at this point in time. You can't have meters in at the end users if you're not even doing your DMAs properly. Um, so yeah, I think our conclusion at the end of that was technology is great, um, the implementation is very important, but for each client out there it will be different and make sure that you apply the right technology in the right area for your specific municipality, not focusing on just what's out there and grabbing whatever's on the table. Thanks. Great. Thank you.
We're doing really well. Thank you. I really appreciate everyone's being a real sport with the report backs. Okay, so uh, our topic was about leveraging uh, AMI data. So we prioritized and said um, the easy and the quick wins to leverage the data is we're going to get more accurate, reliable meter reading, uh, and that's going to uh, help with the trust with our consumers. We're going to have more near real-time information, which allows us to do a whole host of other use cases. Uh, we're going to be able to better identify leaks before and after the meter. Uh, we, we're going to focus uh, the data to help improve billing as well as revenue collection. And then I think the most, one of the most, imp uh, one of the other ones that's uh, 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 quite important um, is around being more proactive or more predictive in your operations. Uh, so that's some of the ways we're going to leverage uh, the AMI data. Um, another way is just on the people skills uplift. Uh, it's going to drive organizations, municipalities to really empower uh, the employees that work there and give them a new set of skills. Um, there's definitely, we're going to leverage it on around energy reduction, especially where it comes to the production of water. Uh, and then something innovative that I think may happen in the country, we're seeing it with electricity around uh, third-party energy wheeling. I wouldn't be surprised if in the future we're going to have water wheeling. Digitizing the water reticulation network is going to be important for these bilateral transactions in the future. And yeah, that's basically it. Last one is all the data probably needs to be correlated, visualized, and integrate multiple sources of this data. So the concept of the digital operation center or a network operation center will be key as well going forward in the way we leverage the AMI data. Cool. Brilliant. Thanks, Rashid. I must submit um, on this data piece, you know, I, I know we're talking about data within a utility, but I sit in the center of city government and I see similar journeys going on in energy and in water. And you start to imagine a future where a city could have a much better understanding of the customer from multiple dimensions and improve service delivery, not just for water. Right, good afternoon. Um, our group, based over there, we were tasked with the, uh, the looking at the topic of unlocking the benefits and risk of AMI and the data associated with it. And uh, we were particularly interested in the granular data that comes from the smart meters and also the information and data that we are not using but retrieving and how then you transform that in from a liability into an asset. So we started off by looking at some of the barriers and just to give you some key insights, um, we looked at one of the major barriers being customer acceptance and how do you basically develop a change management strategy to influence the psychology uh, of consumers to be able to use these smart meters. Of course, vandalism, we spoke, uh, spoke a lot about that. And then skills and actually having the infrastructure. Skills becomes very important, especially when we look at skills of the future, but that's directly linked to the, uh, the uses of AMI data and how do you transform these skills without actually uh, you know, firing or dismissing uh, human beings, but how do you upskill them to do far more uh, uh, value-adding uh, uh, projects uh, within your utility or municipality. Some of the other barriers, one of the main ones we see at utility-based is the IT-OT convergence and how do you basically create a technology stack of data which can be leveraged and harnessed and used across the entire value chain, not just by IT or engineers in OT. Um, security, I think we had a lot, lot of chats about security, know your stakeholders, vandalism and funding. So all of these uh, risks can be transformed easily into uh, enablers and into value propositions that makes these projects far more attractive, enablers in terms of interoperability of the data, uh, use of best fit technology. It, you don't have to have the best AMI data or meter, but you have to have a meter that helps you to achieve what you want based on your digital maturity of your organization, getting consumer buy-in, political buy-in, etc. We focused a lot on Gen AI. You're producing lots of data, so how do you use generative AI or chatbots, for example, to streamline your operations to make quicker, faster, better decisions, um, revenue protection as well, and then using data as a service or metering as a service becomes important. Ultimately, you want to be able to reskill your employees. You want to use the data, and you want to create or do better things such as network modeling, energy optimization, chemical optimization, understanding the psychology of your of your consumers, and then finally. Just rushing through here. Yeah?
data collected but not being used in terms of integrated monitoring evaluation. And that's where we want to leave you. With like, look, you need to have a technology stack where all of your data from SCADA, GIS, uh, SAP, Maximo is linked into one particular platform from your AMI to make the most useful 24-7 cutting edge decisions to create efficiencies and effectiveness, lower the cost of doing business and increase efficiencies. We spoke about budgets and not having budgets, but when you're able to do this effectively, you have basically funders, you have incentives, and you have a payback system which speaks for itself as well. So we spoke about watershedding as well, water rationality, it's already happening, and then link that to scenario planning. Excellent. Squeeze it out there.